Hello, welcome to Shrink Wrap, a show about mental health and all things psychological. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Lewis. Today our subject is going to be suicide, um, an issue that we read about in the newspapers all the time, particularly these days as we hear about almost an epidemic of suicide amongst our returning armed forces. Um, our guest today is Dr. Adrian Barna. Adrian is uh, a psychologist from Virginia and she's worked for many years as a counseling psychologist at George Mason University and recently she's been a trainer for the American Association of Su Suicidology. Welcome. How are you thank today? You. Thank you. Um, one of the things we wanted to talk about is what, what might be going on in terms of this increase in suicide and what are some of the signs and how can we learn from this so that we might be attentive to the people in our lives who might be at risk. Does that sound like a place to start? Sounds good. So I, I, I guess where I'd like to begin, Adrian, is, is there an epidemic of suicide these days? Well, I'm not sure I would use the term epidemic, but the statistics that have come out recently do show that there's been an increase in suicide. Uh, the CDC recently put out a study that showed that between 1999 and 2014, there has been a 24% increase wow. in the age-adjusted suicide rates. I believe it was 10.3 to 13.5 per 100,000 population. There's been an increase in both male and female rates across all ages from 10 to 74. So we do see um, an increase. Let me say a little bit more in terms of females. The greatest increase in rates has been between the ages of 10 and 14, oh my gosh. which is certainly... Uh, raises a lot of concern for all of us and for parents. Um, and for males, the greatest increase has been between the ages of 45 and 64. So, you know, we can talk more specifically about that, but there is certainly an increase in the suicide rates. We have about around 42,000 suicides per year in the United States. Uh, in Do those statistics include our returning armed forces? Those folks? include uh, anything that has been identified as cause of death was suicide. Now, it may be a little bit different if you look at some ways of uh, some people who die by suicide, it doesn't get classified as a suicide. So well, let's think a little bit about, this sounds like a cultural phenomenon, there's some, something is changing at the macro level here. Some guesses as to what might be going on that, that makes these groups so vulnerable, particularly mm -hmm. girls 10 to 14. I, I think of those as uh, little kids almost, young tweeners. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot of sense about how to say the, the 10 to 14 year old um, on, a, on a larger level. Um, I think, you know, these have been very complex years mm -hmm. for us. And, you know, the, the greatest increase in that period of 1999 to 2014 was since 2006. So if you think about what's been going on in our culture since 2006, we had the huge financial problem. Mm -hmm. And if we have an increase in males between the ages of 45 and 64, that's very likely related to that. Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of cultural issues. I think the anxiety is much higher uh, in our culture. I look at, you know, having worked with university college students for uh, over 30 years and living in Was near Washington, D.C., I noticed in our college students that were coming in uh, post 9-11 that in particularly in recent years, anxiety went up quite high. It's actually the number one concern now mm -hmm. for college students across the country. But I noticed it at our university being close to one of the sites that was intricately involved in 9-11. And I think about if these students who are, are now in college were six or seven years old mm -hmm. when 9-11 occurred, they've grown up in a society that is much more anxiety provoking. And so I think there's that kind of an issue. We have the financial issues. Um, we have such a busy society. A big issue here is coping styles. So Adrian, one of the things that we've been talking about is how maybe some of the cultural changes since the 2006, 7, 8 time period has really started to affect kids and families. And it sounds like we can see that affecting older people who've been the breadwinners or have lost the ability to be breadwinners maybe, and their kids. Mm -hmm. I, I guess the, the word that people in the mental health field use is, wow, we've got a lot of dysregulated people. Mm -hmm. People have a hard time regulating their emotions. 
Is that a part of this dilemma, do you think? Well, I, I think it's, it's, it's a very large part. Um, the issue of suicide, when we look at assessing suicide risk, you need to look at the risk factors. You also need to look at what we call the protective factors. And protective factors can reduce but not eliminate risk mm -hmm. for suicide. So protective factors include things like a person's ability to cope. Mm -hmm. It also includes their access to care. It includes their support system. Where's their family? Who are their friends? It includes a lot of different things. So I think that part of what's going on now in terms of the coping is, are we helping younger people through the developmental tasks of learning how to manage emotions, mm -hmm. positive and negative? Mm -hmm. Are we also teaching people to have realistic expectations? Mm. Uh, something that I would encounter a lot with college students is, I'm not happy all the time. Well, it's not realistic to be mm, happy, happy all, all the time. Mm. And so we need to help people learn how to manage those emotions. So if somebody hasn't developed those coping strategies, then it may be very difficult for them when they have some of the risk factors. So if you do look at these 10 to 14 year old kids, they don't have the coping strategies yet developmentally, we wouldn't expect them to. So sometimes people who don't know those coping strategies start to think about how mm. can I deal with this hurt? And we'll talk, we need to talk more about what's behind the suicide. Um, but you look at it, I mean, think about in our lives when a, an adolescent, a relationship ends, it's the end of the world. Yeah. It's terrible. And that's sometimes one of the reasons that a young person thinks about killing themselves because sure. their love of their life has ended the relationship. Whereas if you're in your 30s or 40s and a relationship ends, we've developed coping strategies. Mm -hmm. And those serve as protective factors to help us get through those difficult times. So the coping strategies are really important to develop and that includes learning how to man manage emotions. You know, it's interesting because, and I, I think we're gonna be talking about this in another show in terms of how do you teach parents to do this better for their children but I guess that assumes that parents themselves mm -hmm. have the ability to manage their emotions without using mm -hmm. drugs or alcohol or what other, other things that they may be using. So in order to teach your kids to do that, you have to have an awareness right. as a parent that you can soothe yourself and manage your own emotions so right. that you can be available for your children. So right. this is really potentially a multi-layered issue. In, a very... in order to help the kids, we need to sort of help the parents to help the kids. We need to help the parents, and, and this is a community issue. It's mm -hmm. a family issue, it's a community issue. So yes, soothing oneself, learning how to regulate one's, one's emotions, how to handle crises, all those are skills that we need to develop in our kids, and if they haven't developed them, then when they come to therapy, should they be you know, having folks suicidal thoughts, that's where a lot of the therapy is gonna focus on helping them to develop coping uh, strategies. Uh, would it be reasonable to guess that some of the drug usage and the prescription drug usage by kids is uh, an attempt, misguided that it might be, to help them manage their affect, their mm -hmm. emotions, because they don't have the other psychological skills to do it. So they are the generation that's been raised with commercials about take a pill for this and take a pill for that, and uh, that looks like a quick fix compared to actually doing the psychological work to develop the ability to do that. Well, there's a lot of issues you've raised in, in that comment. Um, first of all, a lot of suicides do involve alcohol or other substances. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly when somebody is using alcohol and they're suicidal, that raises the, the risk. Factor. The risk. They mm -hmm. become impulsive and they can make, you know, we all make bad decisions when we're in, under the influence of some substance. So somebody's more likely to think about something like killing themselves when they're under the influence of that. So the other um, point I want to make is a lot of people will say, well, well, why would somebody kill themselves? You know, you see somebody and you say, gee, they seem to be doing fine. Why did they do this? Well, what we don't know is what's been going on inside the person in many cases. And in a lot of cases, that person is in a lot of pain, mm. psychological pain. And this is really the driving force behind the suicide. This person feels like they have no other way to end the pain than to kill themselves. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people say, well, you know, that's a permanent 
yeah. solution to a temporary problem. You can get through the pain. But if you haven't learned how to deal with the pain and you can't figure a way out of it, then it comes to the point that you say, I'm going to end my life and that'll take away the pain. So medication or some sort of mm -hmm. a substance may be a step before that, but then sure. that compounds it when you put that together with the pain. If the pain stays and you're using these substances, well, you keep escalating the amount that you take. become even more yeah. hopeless and yeah. feel more trapped and are more likely to, to end up dying by I, suicide. I guess that's the thing that scares parents and loved ones of people at risk. I don't always know that somebody's in pain. How do you know somebody's in pain? I guess one of the great myths about suicide is you shouldn't ask because you'll, you'll now suggest something they hadn't thought of. I guess I'm wondering, since that myth has seemed so pervasive for so long, if we could talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. If you have somebody, your child, your adolescent, a loved one, a co-worker, what, what's a way to start approaching that that sort of busts through some of these myths? Well, it is a myth, and it's really important to ask a person about suicide. It is an incredibly difficult question to ask, but it is important. There are many ways that you can ask it. First of all, you're not just pulling this out of the blue and saying, I'm going to ask them, are you thinking about killing yourself? You've got data, mm. things that the person is doing or not doing, or that you've had a conversation. You ask them about things, and you gather data. And you say, you know, with all this that's going on, my sense is there's a lot of pain for you. Mm. And sometimes when people are hurting, they want to end that pain and they think about killing themselves. Mm -hmm. What ways have you thought about killing yourself? Have you thought about killing yourself? So it's, it's a really important thing. So people say, well, I'm giving them an idea. Now, with a young child, you might be, mm -hmm. okay? But with an adolescent or older, you're not giving them the idea. They've already thought about it. In fact, by saying to them, you're hurting, and one of the ways that you're thinking about dealing with this pain is killing yourself can be very relieving. They say, you know, this person gets it. Yeah. They get that I'm hurting and that I'm thinking about ending my life. Right, that I, I matter enough to them. And that they're taking the time to ask me. So it's a really important question to ask. And it needs to be a direct question. Are you or have you thought about killing yourself? Mm. But you do that after you've kind of gathered and you're having a conversation with them. I'm concerned about you because this is going on or this is not going on. And you know, I know it sounds like you're hurting. Sometimes people think about killing themselves. It's a different question than are you thinking about hurting yourself. Mm -hmm. Hurting yourself involves self-injury, cutting oneself, trying to Which manage the pain. Which doesn't necessarily turn into suicide. And, and you know, being a, cutting yourself is often not suicidal behavior. People get this reaction, oh, this person is trying to kill themselves because they're cutting themselves. They're trying to find a way to manage the pain short of killing themselves. Mm -hmm. So they're two separate questions. It's almost like letting steam out of the kettle. Right. We wish people could find another way to do that, but we, could, we need to understand that differently. Right. So it's important to ask the question directly, and I know it's very, very hard for parents, but it's something that, that needs to be asked and not... You, not. You, you know, one of these groups that sound like they're so at risk are these 10 to 14-year-old girls, and one of the things we know about them is many of them are completely immersed in social media. And some of the messages that come through social media, bullying, teasing, uh, th th that looks like a real difficult place for kids to navigate. And I wonder if parents need to not let kids get so lost in that, mm -hmm. that the parent is unable to have those kinds of conversations. Because it sounds to me that before you have the conversation about, are you thinking about hurt, killing yourself, you needed to have had many, many conversations about how you doing? What's life like? Right. How, how intimately do I know what's going on for you? So that there's a, um, an avenue between that parent and child so a child feels comfortable when they're struggling, letting their parents know before we've gotten to that mm -hmm. point. If the child's only vehicle is social media, I'm not sure he or she is always getting the support on social media that they, they could potentially get from loving parents. Yeah. 10 to 14 years old, their friends can't give them the kind of support no. that they need. So parents do need to make sure they're having that connection with their kids. They do need to make sure that they're aware of what the social media is. And they need to have conversations with their kids about what's going on on social media. It goes back to this coping strategies. Kids who are 10 to 14 don't have the strategies to, uh, alone to deal with being bullied or, or negative things said about them. So parents do really need to stay in touch and have, have a conversation. You know. This can be really painful. 
things, people can say really mean things. If this is happening, we need to have a conversation. Mm. It's really important that you not do something to go away from us. And I, I personally think, you know, a 10 year old, 11 year old doesn't understand what they're doing when they, they kill themselves. No, they don't understand they, the permanence right. of it at all. So, talking with them about, you know, if you think you're going to do something to go away or just get out of it, let's talk. And, and we need to have that agreement that we're going to talk before you do that kind of thing to yourself. You know, one, one of the things that I found is even with college students, they don't necessarily see their parents as resources for that anymore. And it sounds like somewhere culturally, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure why, parents aren't seen as those kinds of resources almost starting fairly early. And kids don't then rely on them at 2 o'clock in the morning to be, I just broke up with somebody or I'm scared about something. And I'm not sure how that all changed. I know that parents have been incredibly busy uh, working m many jobs. Um, and, and I wonder if we can sort of forget that that kind of emotional fueling of kids is very labor intensive and takes a lot of time and, and requires a parent to have the emotional resources in order to fuel their child. Mm -hmm. So it seems like somewhere along the line we've lost the time and the attention for that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's kind of scary. It is scary. You know, if a parent doesn't have time, I think they can at least have a conversation. Look, if I'm not available, if I can't have these conversations with you, who's going to have it? You know, we, you know, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of grandparents around in mm -hmm. a lot of cases, but are there other people that they can go to to talk because they don't want to upset their parents, they don't want to, they don't feel comfortable with them? Have a conversation. Who else can be in their support network for them to talk to um, if they're getting to this point that they are feeling like they are hurting so much that they've got to do something to stop that pain, whether they think they're going to sleep and they end up killing themselves or they're actually mm -hmm. thinking about killing themselves. I guess that's one of the things that gets parents to bring kids to therapy. Mm -hmm. uh, they may come to the attention of the school psychologist if, or the school counselor if kids are um, acting out. Sometimes depressed kids aren't just... Um, sad and unhappy, they can be acting out their, their depression, mm -hmm. and so they may come to the attention of school personnel, but sometimes parents pick this up mm -hmm. and will bring children to, to therapy a, as a way of getting another adult involved who mm -hmm. is trained to sort of be more available in that mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. Or are there other adults that they can at least get who can then make sure that they get to that professional help if the parents can't do it? That's why it's really a community issue. Yeah, and you know, it's, it's funny having worked with some people o over time who've really struggled, sometimes it's that one available empathic adult. Mm -hmm. And it isn't always a mom or a dad. Mm -hmm. you know, sometimes it is a teacher. Mm -hmm who connects with a child mm -hmm. and provides that kind of positive, you matter, I care what's going on with you. Mm -hmm. And that can really be a lifesaver in a turbulent mm -hmm. sea of emotional stuff that mm -hmm. allows a kid to make it through those hard times. Mm -hmm. And I think some kids are lucky enough to have that. Some kids are lucky enough to recognize it when they, when they have it available. Mm -hmm. um, well, let's talk for a minute about veterans because that is something we've all been reading about, the horrible rate of suicide amongst our returning veterans seems to have gone through the roof, particularly coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. Do we have some sense of why this group seems to be so vulnerable these days? Well, I think that's a very complex issue. Um, and one of the things we have to be aware of when we do look at suicide is each person is a little bit different, so we can't make blanket mm -hmm. statements. So yes, they may come back uh, with post-stress uh, uh, syndrome, and that certainly may be a factor for them. We also need to know what are they coming back to. Mm -hmm. now, there are, you know, Loss is a very, very big thing in, in suicide, and that loss can be something very tangible or it can be something intangible. But if you're a veteran who comes back and you've lost your relationships, you've lost your job, you don't feel like you fit in, um, you don't feel welcome, 
you know, I think we have a little bit less of that than we had with the Vietnam veterans, but there's still, it can be a perception on the part of the veteran of not feeling like they fit in or are not welcome back. But loss is a very big thing. What you have when you've got the military is, in, in the military, there's such a camaraderie mm. and a togetherness. And when you come back to your community, you may not have that at all. And you may be floundering because your relationships are different. People can't understand what you've been through. You've lost your job. You're financially struggling. So there's so many losses that they can have. Other veterans may come back, and they can go back to a job. They can go back. Their family's and, and, fine. And they have an intact family to go back to, and, and they are welcome back. And, and they may have other veterans that they can mm -hmm. hang out with who can understand what they've mm -hmm. been through. So it really is going to depend upon what the individual comes back to. But loss is really important, and what have been their exposures to trauma over there. Um, so the, it's, it's a complex thing, but regardless of veterans or others, you have to look at the individual situation, and it's always the individual's perception of their situation. Like uh, Thomas Joyner has done a lot of research on uh, suicidology, on suicide. He's, he has an interpersonal theory of suicide, and he talks about three things need to come together for a person to die by suicide. One is thwarted belongingness, so not feeling like they belong. Really isolated, isolated. And in this by themselves. Mm -hmm. yeah. The other is perceived burdensomeness. Now the perceived mm -hmm. is really important because you have people who are not a burden to others, but they, they, think, they, they think they are. So if somebody comes back, a veteran, they feel like they're a burden to their family, their family's moved on, well they're kind of still back here before they went to the military. You've got a, a person who's older and they're they're feeling like their family sees them as a burden, even though they're getting a lot of love and care. So it's the perception that's important. And then you put that together with the capability mm -hmm. to kill oneself. It does take a certain capability, and veterans have often have that mm -hmm. capability from their experiences and their access to means, and we'll need to talk about that. But those three things coming together put a person at higher risk. Mm -hmm. Now, does that mean everybody is going to do that who's been in the military? No, it depends again upon enough. their coping strategies sure. and what their support system is and the protective factors. But those three the perce perception is really important. Mm -hmm. So people are going to act on their perceptions, even though we may not see it the same way. You know, you've talked about loss. I guess the other piece to this is we assume that suicide is the terrible consequence of people who have a depression that just doesn't go away. That the depression is so depleting and so draining that people just throw in the towel. And, and we do see a lot of people who are diagnosed depressed these days. Mm -hmm. uh, they go to therapy, they take medication. And I, I'm wondering, clearly everybody who's depressed doesn't commit suicide. Right. So it, 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 it may be a necessary but not sufficient part of the equation. Um, I guess we could say that people who commit suicide are probably depressed, right. but it takes more than just being depressed. Right, depression by itself is, is not is usually not enough for someone to kill themselves. You know, when you look back and do suicide uh, autopsies, they would say about 90% of the people who die by suicide do meet the diagnostic criteria for depression or some other uh, psychological issue. Um, but uh, many of them have not been in treatment, so they haven't officially gotten that diagnosis. So, yes, if somebody has a mental health issue, you do need to take that into account in, in assessing their risk level. But depression alone does not make a person suicidal. If you have depression and you've taken, they've taken medication and they've had all sorts of treatment and it's not working and it goes on longer and longer, they don't have a good support system, you've got more risk factors coming in, then the chances of suicide do go up. So you have to have look at all these risk factors. Now, one of the risk factors that is commonly looked at is mood disorders, mm -hmm. and that would include depression. Mm -hmm. So in terms of warning signs, there is a very common uh, mnemonic that has been put together uh, by the American Association of Suicidology. Um, you know, people can go to their website, suicidology.org, and, and look at this for themselves. But um, the mnemonic is, is path warm? And these are the risk factors, the more acute risk factors that people want to look for. And these have been shown by research to be present in the people who die by suicide within the previous 12 months of their lives. So the first one, the I in Is Path Warm is ideation. Does mm -hmm. the person have ideation? Whether it's passive or active, you know, a therapist needs to assess that. Mm -hmm. This is not something a, a, a 
family member needs to assess and say, oh, it's okay. They probably need, need to, get to get this get person. professional. Right. The S is for substance use. Substance use, and I'm not saying substance abuse, substance use, because people can decide one time they're going to get drunk, and if they're depressed, anxious, have a lot of these other warning signs. There's bad coming it's, together of things, yeah. They could end up killing themselves. So you've got ideation, substance use, and the is. In the path, you've got P stands for purposelessness. Does the person have a purpose in life? If they don't have a purpose, then we need to be concerned. They have no job, they have no connections with people, they just don't want to live, they see they want to escape to get away from the pain, there's lots of, you just don't have any purpose, so you want to be concerned about that. Mm -hmm. The A in PATH is for anxiety, and anxiety often comes along with insomnia. Now, when we get tired, what happens to our coping strategies? They go away. They go down. Yeah. So, Insomnia is important to look at. That's one of the first things to address if you've got somebody who's not doing well. So the anxiety can become so painful that a person decides they're going to end the anxiety by killing themselves. Mm -hmm. The T in PATH is, stands for trapped. They feel there's just no way out. I've tried everything. I just can't get out. I'm out of options. Yeah. And the H is hopelessness. Mm -hmm. And of course, a depression that doesn't respond to treatment and doesn't, you know, there's not a good support system, there's not good care, the it's person becomes be like increasingly this forever. hopeless. So they become increasingly hopeless. And that is one of the strongest research based factors that we find in suicide. Mm -hmm. The person becomes more and more hopeless. So you move on to the warm part. The W is for withdrawal. Are they withdrawing? Mm -hmm. Is it there? It can go both ways. It can be they're withdrawing, or they perceive other people are withdrawing, or other people really are withdrawing. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you've been hanging out with a person, you say, I just don't want to be with this person anymore, and they do leave. Well, that person reads it as rejection and can make them feel uh, less like they're engaged with life. So withdrawal is important. The next A is anger, and that can be somebody who's so angry at themselves that they take the action to kill themselves. And maybe angry at others. Or too. could be angry at others. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you what you did to yeah. me. The R is for recklessness. If they start engaging in reckless behavior that they haven't done before, maybe driving faster, putting themselves in risky situations. So substance abuse, substance acting abuse, out in acting many out. ways. Yeah. And the mood, the M in warm is for mood. And that can be certainly the one we commonly look for is a change from positive to negative for depression. Mm -hmm. But you also want to look at the other way. If somebody's been depressed and suddenly they're, oh, I'm fine, everything's great, you want to be cautious because they may make a decision they're going to end this pain by killing you themselves. Actually, you know, I, I guess one of the things that people talk about is sometimes you actually see people presenting a little less depressed mm -hmm. because they've now made a decision, right. they, they've gone over that hurdle, and in the very short run, there's almost a relief on their part. Right. So that can be a, a, almost a, a sign that that doesn't mean everything's okay. Yeah. So what happens is suddenly, you know, you've been hanging out with somebody because they've been really depressed and you've been giving a lot of time and a lot of energy to them. And suddenly they say to you, that person says to you, I'm doing great. I'm doing much better. So people go back to their lives. Mm -hmm. What does that do? Makes the person feel abandoned. They feel again. abandoned yeah. and they've already made this decision. So it reinforces the decision. Okay. So. Those are the, is path warm is, is a helpful thing to keep in mind in mm -hmm. terms of what are some of the signs. Now, of course, people can have a lot of these signs and never be considering suicide. Others can have one or two and consider suicide. So you have to look at it within the context of the person, but have the conversation. I guess, I guess maybe one way to think about all these signs is this is a lot for somebody to diagnose if they're not professionally trained, and maybe the goal of this is to start picking up some of these warning signs and encouraging or getting a loved one or a friend to a, a, a mental health professional, a, right. a counselor, yeah. a social worker, a psychologist, psychiatrist, somebody who is trained to ask right. those questions and be able to start seeing some of the connections amongst some of these kinds of right. things. So they can take it from there and take it and treat it clinically. You can, the individual who referred them can stay in the background and continue to be a support and talk with how can they be supportive without stepping over the line and taking the responsibility clinically for the individual? I guess people I've seen, though, you know, it's interesting, sometimes are, are afraid their loved one or friend will be angry at them, that, that they'll be insulted and um, they're somehow intruding or violating some space, and th th they hesitate. And I, I guess maybe I'm wondering if they should be a little less concerned about that 
if they are th seeing things that really are of concern. I, I think they need to be less concerned about that. I mean, here you have a choice. Do you want a friend who's angry at you but alive? Mm. Or do you want someone who you didn't talk to and they end up killing themselves? So it's, you know, if they're angry, hopefully they'll work through it. If they don't, but they're alive. At least they're alive. They're alive. Uh, let's just touch on one other thing in our time today. People pick various ways of killing themselves. And one of the things that tends to be awfully lethal are guns. Mm -hmm. and, and I guess I'm wondering, there are people who certainly are good, responsible gun owners. They're hunters. They keep things locked in gun safes. And, and um, they do a very good job of that. And they're, and they're quite serious about it. Um, do you have some suggestions for people who w want to be able to do that but may live with people who are struggling emotionally? I mean, do, is it wise sometimes to get them out of the house, to get mm -hmm. them to mm -hmm. a, a gun range where they can be locked in a safe? Uh, how much is, is the, what we do to sort of make things less available, particularly to impulsive adolescents? So, Access to means is certainly something very, very critical. And here we're talking about safety. We are not talking about gun control. We're talking about <laughs> the safety of individuals. So you know, if there is a situation where you've got an, in, an individual where you're concerned, those guns, and I'm talking about, I'm, I'm going to talk about guns. I'm also going to talk about prescriptions. So those means should be removed from that individual's environment. If it's a gun, a firearm, it should be removed. If it's put in a locked safe, it should, be a com it should be a combination safe where the individual can't get to it, doesn't know the combination. They can find keys. Mm -hmm. So, But it's a good idea to keep it in, at least in a safe that they can't get a hold of. Getting it out of their environment would probably be the preferable thing. And we're talking about any sort of firearm. It could be a gun. It could be a rifle. It could also be an antique gun that's hanging on the wall. Mm -hmm. So getting rid of all those guns, and if an individual, say you have an adolescent who's in a joint custody situation or they have grandparents, removing access to those things in all those environments is really, really important. So guns are one, and of course prescription medications. You know, young people take these, take their parents' medications, and they use them to deal with their own pain. And sometimes they don't mean to die, but they end up dying. And so prescription medications, over-the-counter medications in large amounts, they should be kept in a secure place in the house. Well, I, it seems to me that the opioid epidemic that people talk about can be just as lethal as the guns are. Mm -hmm. um, people can get into trouble very quickly with those kinds of medications mm -hmm. when they're mm -hmm. abused. Yeah. So firearms, prescriptions and, uh, are, are really do need to be controlled. Um, I think that's just good practice, whether you have a, a child who's suicidal or not. I mean, the number of children already this year who have either shot themselves or a sibling or a parent because they found they had a, a gun laying around just really struck me. It's, it's very high, and here we are, only in July. I, I, I know. It's hard to imagine that people would be cavalier about that, and I think sometimes they think a little child, yes, we, you know, some of these kids are four years old, that you don't have to be very old to mm -hmm. sort of play with something and certainly not know what you're doing and it just goes off. And what a horror, not only to the person who dies, but for this little four-year-old who now will have right. to make sense of this for the rest of their so life. So this is basic gun safety. Yeah. If you've got somebody in your house though that you know is at risk for suicide, it's really important to up that and make sure that you really, really do reduce and eliminate, in all cases, access to the firearms and the, prescri the medications. No, we can't take everything away, but those things we can. And then just some obvious things. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, it sounds to me as we sort of sum up that we're really looking at this at a community level. Mm -hmm. Parents are certainly often the first piece to this, but coworkers and school personnel and um, clergy and anybody who comes into contact in a meaningful way. and even work colleagues, mm -hmm. to start picking up some of the signs of this. You don't have to be an expert to do it, right. but a caring remark can right. really make the difference, can right. it?
can make a big difference. And even with adolescents, peers. You know, these many of our adolescents have already been exposed to mental health issues amongst their peers, and they see somebody else who's starting to struggle to help them understand they need to go to the counselor or they need yeah. to go to this person's parents. So um, I, that's that's hard for an adolescent, but I've seen it when it's worked, mm -hmm. and the, the, their friend gets over the initial anger at you. Talk to my parents behind my back. But often it saves a life, mm -hmm. and, and that could be a wonderfully gratifying thing. And I think that's the big thing to look at in terms of if I don't ask, if I don't reach out, this person could end up dying. I guess I'd rather have them be angry. Yeah, I think so And too. alive. Well, thanks so much for um, talking with me today. I just want to be very clear about some services locally so that people have something to do if they need to make a phone call. Here in Massachusetts, we have the Emergency Services Program, and those folks can be reached at 1-877-382-1609, and I think you enter your zip code, and they tell you where an available office might be locally. There's the National Suicide Prevention Line, and that's 1-800-273-TALK, or 273-8255, and I think you said there's a special button if you're a veteran that you automatically can get connected to a veteran support system. Yes. Mm -hmm. So veterans have access through that and just um, civilians as well can use this line as a way to get connected to a crisis line and get some help. Uh, I think here in Massachusetts we have the Massachusetts Coalition for Suicide Prevention and they can be reached at 1-877-870-4673. And obviously in an immediate crisis pick up the phone call and call 911 and our police officers are trained in how to make some initial determinations and get people to a place that can assess them and help them uh, be safe. Thanks so much, Adrian. Thank you. Thanks and uh, thanks for being with us at Shrink Wrap today. We'll see you next time. <music>